Well, a very warm welcome to another edition of our podcast. If this is the first time that you've joined us, an especially warm welcome to you. We do hope you can find somewhere peaceful and somewhere quiet for about the next 20 minutes or so as we seek to find out what God has to say to us through his word. Our opening music was from the hymn Hills of the North Rejoice, which is an Advent hymn looking forward to the coming of Christ. And our theme for today is the parable of the talents, which is about not only waiting for the coming of Christ, but what we should be doing at the same time. But let's start with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we seem to be doing a lot of waiting around at the moment, waiting for things to change, for things to be different, for this heavy burden of a pandemic to be lifted from us. Father, we thank you for all those who are working so hard to try and make things better for us. We thank you for the gifts and the talents of our medical researchers who have been able to come up with possibly an effective vaccine in record time. Lord, we ask you to bless them. Father, in this time of restriction, we may feel that we can't do much. Lord, we ask for your guidance, that we can make a positive difference to those who we know and love, those around us, those who might need a telephone call, a birthday card, or just a quiet word, or a bag of shopping. All things which are necessary and show our concern for other people. Heavenly Father, you are our living hope. Father, guard us from the darkness of despair. Lord, keep our hearts and minds, we pray. For Jesus' sake, Amen. We're going to share a psalm together today, and it's part of Psalm 90. And Psalm 90 focuses on God's eternal nature in contrast to our own human frailties. It's a prayer originally written by Moses, and Mike's going to lead us in the reading of this now. Do feel free to join him with the bold type, won't you? We're going to read together Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. I'll lead with the light type if you will respond with the bold type. Lord, you have been our dwelling places in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, Turn back, you mortals, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away, they're like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are consumed by your anger. By your wrath we are overwhelmed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. So teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. In our scripture readings, we've been working our way through the book of Matthew, and we've reached chapter 25. The setting for this chapter is what we would call in the church Holy Week, that time that leads up to Good Friday and obviously Easter Sunday. On the Monday, Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on the colt of a donkey, a symbol of a king coming into his city in peace. The people, however, were hoping for a military messiah, but that wasn't in Jesus' plan at all. And on the Tuesday, rather than attacking the Romans, Jesus instead enters the temple and cleans it out of all the merchants and traders, those who were seeking to exploit God's people as they came to worship. This doesn't go down well at all with the religious authorities. And on the Wednesday, when Jesus re-enters the temple, they come and they challenge him and ask him by what authority he does what he does and teaches the things that he teaches. Jesus responds by telling them three kingdom parables. Kingdom parables, of course, are everyday stories that people can understand, but which have a deeper, more profound spiritual message as well. The message of the parables is quite clear. They are parables of judgment. And because the religious leaders had rejected God, and specifically in the person of his son, so for the time being at least, God has rejected them. Having been humiliated by these parables, the Pharisees withdraw and gather together with all the enemies of Christ and they plot his downfall. Their initial attack is by means of three difficult questions that they thought he couldn't answer without compromising himself. But Jesus confounds them all and after that we're told that they just didn't dare to ask him any more questions. The time of Jesus in the temple ends with Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem being a symbol of the entire Jewish people, over their rejection of God and of his Messiah, who of course Jesus was. 
Jesus' final words to them was that they wouldn't see him again till they said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this is an important statement because it has a prophetic ray of hope in it. It looks forward to a time when they would accept him. And it also looks to a time when he would come again. And this is the pivot point of the chapter where we now move to Jesus talking about not his first coming, but his second coming. Jesus and his disciples now leave the temple. They cross the Kidron Valley to the east of Jerusalem and climb up the Mount of Olives. This marks the end of Jesus' public ministry. They sit down with the whole vista of Jerusalem and the temple complex below them, and Jesus' disciples want to know what's going to happen next, how the coming of his kingdom was going to play out. Jesus' answer is known as the Olivet Discourse, and it's the longest answer Jesus gives to any question put to him in the entire scriptures. The Old Testament understanding of the coming of Messiah was that he would come, he would destroy his enemies, purify his people and set up his kingdom as one continuous process. Jesus, in his answer, spends a lot of time explaining to his disciples that, in fact, the coming of Messiah was a two-phase process. The first phase was for him to come and win salvation for his people, to atone for their sins, that would involve his death and resurrection and that it would be his second coming when the fullness of the kingdom would be brought about, where judgment would take place and all of God's enemies would be destroyed. He warned them that at the time, just prior to his coming, that many would come proclaiming to be Christ, but that they would be false and that they should not be deceived, that there would be a time of great tribulation and that they were going to need real perseverance if they were going to get to the end and be saved in fullness. The key emphasis of Christ's first coming, of course, is salvation. But as our creeds say, the emphasis of his second coming is that he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Jesus uses the symbolism of a fig tree coming into leaf as a herald for the summer to convey the concept that we should look for the signs of the times, but that the specific day or the hour no one would know but God the Father. Jesus then starts to teach his disciples about these events using kingdom parables. And a feature of many of the kingdom parables that Jesus uses is that they are parables about separation. They're about separating out the true from the false. We can think of parables like the parable of the wheat and the tares, the false wheat, where at the end of the age, when the wheat and the tares are harvested, the tares are then separated out and burned. We can think of the parable of maybe the sheep and the goats, or the good soil and the bad soil, or the good fish and the bad fish from the dragnet. They're all about the separating out of true believers from the false. Last week we looked at the parable of the wise and foolish bridesmaids. Again, separation. The five wise bridesmaids who were prepared, who had oil in their lamps. The five foolish bridesmaids who were unprepared and didn't have oil in their lamps. We saw how the Bible uses the symbolism of oil as being a symbol for the Holy Spirit. So the wise bridesmaids are the ones who had the life of God in them, the Holy Spirit. The foolish bridesmaids were ones who didn't have the life of God within them by his Spirit. They looked the same on the outside, but they were counterfeit. The parable was about being prepared and looking forward to the coming of Christ. It also showed that those who were not prepared, there were terrible consequences for them. They found eventually that when they tried to get into the marriage feast, the door was locked. It was too late. The door to the kingdom was shut. Jesus, again, in the previous chapter, had talked about at that time how one would be taken, another would be left. Again, this idea of separating out. And of course, the underlying imperative is that now is the time to get right with God. Now is the day of salvation. And putting it off, procrastinating, is a very dangerous thing to do indeed. And so we come to today's scripture, which is Matthew 25, 14 to 30, the parable of the talents. And Mike's going to read this for us now. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of St Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. The Parable of the Talents For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. 
In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I've made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I've made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who'd received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I do not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and on my return I'd have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's quite clear from the story that Jesus is the master who has a number of slaves. The word slaves in Greek is doulos, and it's often translated as servants as well. The servants, obviously, are the disciples, or those who would claim themselves to be followers of Jesus. This group is initially made up of Jesus' closest disciples, but as time goes by, that expands, and in the church age, of course, it multiplies greatly to become what we now call the visible church. The long journey described in the parable is, of course, the time between when Jesus ascended into heaven after his resurrection to the time when he would come again to rule and reign. In the book of Acts, we know that the disciples saw Jesus ascend into heaven and Luke, the author of Acts, writes that two men stood by them in white robes at the time and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you have seen him go into heaven. If you remember, we've said that when we interpret kingdom parables that Jesus tells us, that the main things are the simple things and that the simple things are the main things. And of course, the main straightforward thing about this parable is that the time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming is going to be a time of being prepared, of watching and waiting, but it's also going to be a time of doing, of working. The previous parable about the wise and the foolish virgins focused on the waiting aspect, the being prepared aspect of this time. But today's parable is about the doing. It's about the work that we do while we wait. In the parable, the master gives to the servants resources and responsibilities that match their own personal abilities. Not everyone is the same and that the master gives to each servant according to their capacity. We often talk about a person as being particularly gifted, maybe music or as a craftsperson. And of course, the whole concept of gift is receiving something, an ability, from somebody else, namely God in this instance. It's an act of grace, a free gift. With response to what God requires from us, there's a principle that works its way throughout the entirety of Scripture that God doesn't require from us anything that he doesn't supply to us in the first place. This concept of gifting reminds us that being a Christian isn't just about being, it's about doing. It's about finding out what your purpose is in God's kingdom. 
Being a Christian isn't about sitting round waiting for heaven twiddling our thumbs, but it is a time of active working. We use the word talent to describe our abilities, but primarily in New Testament times, talents were units of weight, so probably they were given a considerable amount of money, a considerable amount of resources to use on behalf of their master. And along with ability and along with resources comes the concomitant responsibility for our own actions, for what we do with them. It's also quite clear from the story that the servants were given the resources, the talents, in order not to work for themselves, but for the benefit of the king and his estate. So the parable primarily is about us working for God's kingdom, not for our own status or material benefit. And this parable demands us to answer the question, what is the focus of our lives? Is it our own kingdom or God's kingdom we're working for? So they all receive their talents, either the five or the two or the one, and the master then departs on his long journey. We then are allowed to see what the reaction is of the servants to the responsibility and the resources that they've been given. We see that the servant with the five talents goes off and we're not told what he does, but he obviously works very hard and is able to double his master's money. So that instead of having five talents, he now has ten. Likewise, the one with two talents goes off and is able to again double his money. No longer does he have two talents, but he has four that he has earned on behalf of his master. But of course, we then come to the one who is given the single talent. In contrast, he does nothing and just buries his talent in the ground to keep it safe and then just waits. And so eventually, after a delay, the master returns from his journey. And then there is a day of reckoning. A time where the master calls his servants to him to give an account of what they have done while he has been away. The scripture is quite clear that all of us will have to stand before God's judgment throne and give an account for what we've done in our lives. So here the servant, who had been given five talents, brings the five extra talents back to his master. And his master commends him, saying, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Likewise, the servant who had been given two talents and had turned them into four is also commended by his master with exactly the same words. Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. It's almost that what Jesus is rewarding is not so much the quantity that they've been able to produce as the attitude of trustworthiness that they've demonstrated in their dealings. Jesus' response also gives us a little glimpse into what it might be like in heaven. Rather than sitting on a cloud with a harp, doing nothing in particular, it appears to be that Jesus gives those servants who have been trustworthy even more responsibility. He puts them in charge of many things. So it would seem to be that the kingdom, heaven, is going to be a place where we will still be working for the glory of the king. But then, of course, in this parable of separation, we come to the unfaithful servant the one who had just buried his talent and had done nothing. His response to being given responsibility is a negative one. And it appears from his answers to the master that this inactivity has come from a wrong relationship with his master, not perceiving the true character and nature of his master. A wrong relationship has led to wrong actions. He tries to justify his inactivity by accusing his master, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. The master isn't fooled at all. And as George Herbert says, God sees hearts as we see faces. Well, Jesus saw the heart of the servant as much as the words he was saying with his mouth. And he condemns the servant as being wicked and lazy. 
because the servant was wrong in his heart, it resulted in him being wrong in his actions. The master then, possibly surprisingly, takes the talent from the lazy servant and gives it to the one who already had five. I rather like the New Living Translation of this section, where it says, To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. What is more alarming, we then find that the master, rather than just dismissing this lazy slave, pronounces a judgment of condemnation on him and commands that he be taken out and thrown into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So in both the parable of the wise and foolish virgins and the parable of the talents, the consequences of either not being ready or not working in God's kingdom awaiting his coming are terminally serious. For the foolish bridesmaids, the door into the kingdom is shut. They are left outside in the darkness of the night. And here this lazy servant is thrown again into outer darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, a phrase which Jesus uses on several occasions as a picture of hell itself. Well, what are we to take from this salutary lesson? Well, firstly, that our time of waiting for the kingdom is a time of activity not inactivity. We also have the challenge to identify what gifts God has given us, and also how he wants us to use them, and what we're to do in the advancement of his kingdom. Remember, God requires nothing of us that he doesn't give us in the first place. He is not an unreasonable master, but a fully reasonable one, a loving master. And the servants in the parable today worked hard because they loved their master. They wanted to work for his benefit. And that came, obviously, from a relationship, a deep, positive relationship they had with their master. So for us, we start off, in a sense, not only with identifying the gift, but asking ourselves, what's our relationship with God like? Because if that relationship isn't right, then we're not going to do right. We're not going to use our gifts aright. We're not going to use our gifts for his glory, maybe for our own, yes, but not for God's. We also recognise that not only do we have a relationship with God, but that relationship brings responsibility. And the question is, how are we meeting our responsibility towards God? Are we working for him? If so, in what way? If not, well, we may need to start. We need to identify some way in which we can serve the purposes of God in our own lives. And finally, the parable reminds us that for each one of us, there will come the day when we will stand before Christ our Master and give an account of what we've done. And I pray that for you who are listening today, that the words that Jesus will be saying will be, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Master. And so to our closing prayers. Lord Jesus, in this time of waiting for your coming, may we be truly prepared. May we have oil in our lamps, the oil of your Holy Spirit, and that we might burn bright for you. And may, Lord, we work during this time for your kingdom, not so much for ourselves, but for your glory. Father, we pray that you show us the gifts that we might have given by you and how we might use them to honour your name and to advance your kingdom. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. And may the blessings of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon your soul and give you peace. Amen. Until next week, God bless you.